Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me today, I have Dr. Nameka Obiariri, investment banking executive, and Achike Chude, a public affairs analyst. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on This Day Live today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay, very quickly, we've had two guests. Um, first, Dr. Muda Yusuf of the Center for the Promotion of uh, Enterprises, CPPE, uh, talking about some of the measures introduced recently by the CBA to stabilize the foreign exchange regime and also to assert regulatory control uh, in certain aspects. Well, we didn't discuss the cash reserve uh, you know, deposit ratio uh, that the CBA says is going to you know, take back to orthodox path rather than the arbitrary CRR regime that we had uh, before now. Then we talked about you know, controls with regard to export, with regard to import duty, with regard to uh, forests, uh, you know, in the possession of the uh, banks and how, you know, the directive that that should be offloaded has had some effect. And also the general attempt by the CBN uh, to just ensure forest liquidity. Then, of course, we talked about the 37-man committee that has now been set up to propose a new national minimum wage. So what would be the right kind of new national minimum wage? That old question, now that inflation is uh, out of the roof. Then, of course, the other subjects we considered with uh, Paul Ejime, uh, who is on the ground in Dakar, Senegal, is the postponement of the uh, Senegalese election scheduled originally for February uh, 25, now postponed indefinitely by President Maki uh, Sall, and the implications for uncertainty and also political party relations and also sub-regional peace, uh, you know, uh, and then, of course, ECOWAS intervention. And beyond that, the uh, exit of uh, the J, Burkina Faso and Mali from ECOWAS without delay, as they put it, and the J uh, issuing a statement uh, practically tongue-lashing uh, Nigeria for being part of a conspiracy an anti-Pan-African, you know, conspiracy against Niger in particular, which according to the Foreign Affairs of, uh, of uh, the Ministry of Niger, helped Nigeria during the uh, Civil War, and that Nigeria is a bad neighbor. We should not be teaching uh, Niger uh, lessons. After all, Nigeria, apart from what ECOWAS did, cut off electricity supply uh, to Niger and blocked you know, a movement of goods and services, particularly food items and pharmaceutical. Well, maybe Nigeria deserves a tongue lashing, but uh, Paul A. Jimmy says uh, <laughs> this is surprising that uh, Niger would think he can talk to Nigeria, uh, he can talk to Nigeria like that. So these are some of the issues. Let me start with you, Dr. Biariri. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Abati. Um, the CBN um, intervention in the market, like I said, is a very interventionist approach. Very, very good. And uh, if you see clearly, their intervention has actually moderated the Naira galloping to 2,000 Naira to $1. Uh, as at the closure of market on Friday, market moderated at about 1,450 Naira to $1. You know, from a Wednesday, Thursday high of 1,575 Naira per dollar, which is a very good approach. But like I said, this intervention is interventionist in nature and does not tackle the root cause of the matter. What they've done is what we call opiate or elixir. We need to tackle the source of the problem and which is the dollar illiquidity in the market, the lack of the positive of supply of the dollar compared to the demand. And that comes also to the physical side of the market. As of today, you know, people have complained. I, I don't want us to complain. We need to look forward. The deregulation of that oil and gas sector removal of subsidy was a good decision. Um, the margin of the foreign exchange market rate to avoid the arbitrage window that created the room for the criminality that happened between 2015 to 2023 was a good one. So what do we do to rescue? Of course, like Nigeria said, it, most Nigerians have complained, galloping inflation and other things. Now, let us look even back to history. Buhari became president May 29, 2050. We need to understand the root cause of our problem before we can provide credible solutions. Buhari inherited foreign reserve of $29 billion. Between 2015 to 2023, 
total import volume of Nigeria was $451 billion. Go and check the records. Total export received was about $406 billion. Buhari and Co. borrowed over $32 billion from 2015 to 2023 when he handed over to Tinibu because at, as at 20, um, June 30th, 2015, external debt position, total federation was $10 billion. Buhari left at $43 billion to Tinibu. Foreign direct remittances was about $168 billion that came into this country within those eight years. So if you look at the net dollar inflow and net dollar cash flow, outflow, there is no way Naira will have lost over 700, 600 um, Naira to $1 under Buhari and now galloping that. What Tinibu is experiencing today was a foundational recklessness that was, uh, that was led on, a foundation that was led under Buhari. And now, yes, I'm not asking the right question. Let me, I will explain to you, Dr. Bati. This is the truth. The 23.2 trillion Naira that was printed and handed over to Buhari and Co. by MFL is at the root cause of what we are experiencing today. Remember in 2018, Obaseki cried out and they lampooned him that printing Naira and handing over to Buhari and Co. without any project tied to it will lead to where we are today. See, the truth is, and I also want this to be on record, the CBN, they are doing their utmost best to intervene. Interventionism will not solve the problem. The problem lies at the root cost of it. Between 2015 to 2020, there was a bazaar in Nigeria. In fact, Tinibu should go back and do what Obasanjo did when he became president. Obasanjo hated the worst economy, worse than what Tinibu hated. Obasanjo went after those that took away our dollar out of Nigeria. He called the Abacha family to question and they negotiated. Most of the proceeds are still being enjoyed by Nigeria. Tinibu should, should, should develop that political will and call the practitioners that worked under Buhari for eight years. We are talking about over hundred billion dollars that was taken out of the economy. That is where we are because if you look at the net dollar inflow into Nigeria over that eight years and net dollar outflow, there is no way we will have been where we are today if not for the criminality and the corruption that experience, that we experienced within that period. Obasanjo came to power and left after eight years. Naira lost only that eight naira to one dollar. Um, Jonathan Ayadua came to power twenty o o seven. When the official rate was 124 and left at 199, Naira lost to dollar by 78, Naira to one dollar in eight years. What had happened over the next nine years is something that Nigerians will not wish again. So why the CBN is trying to do interventionism? We must also look at how do we show up the supplies of the dollar. Under, under Sanusi, Lamido Sanusi, under Charles Oludo, like you, you can, there's no country that actually have a free flow that is not managed. Even China intervenes in their forest exchange market. America intervenes. But you can only intervene when there is liquidity. Sanusi was able to intervene because there was liquidity. All the proceeds were being paid into the accounts. Today in Nigeria, output was 2.5 million barrels in 2011. It came down under Buhari and had not recovered. Under Buhari, Melekiare in your studio told Nigerians that we lose $1.9 billion of uh, crude resources to inefficiency and theft every month, which is $22 billion annually. Up to today, nobody has accounted for those losses. Nobody has accounted for those different. And the, as long as we do not have liquidity of the dollar, which is 90% controlled by the physical side of the market, see, whatever the CBN is doing now is just like moderating the galloping. If we do not fix the physical side, Stop the oil thefts and criminality that place. Stop the cost of governance that is over bloated. Stop the MDAs and the governors from taking FAC, Jack, and IGR and pursuing dollar and providing security to our Nigerians to go into productivity of this economy. I tell you, what the CBN has done very good is just to moderate it. If we don't fix the supply side of dollar by tackling the physical side, which is 90%, the problem of Nigeria, after this moderation, it will go to 2000. Mark it Tuesday. Wow. <laughs> that sounds uh, ominous, but you know, it's a possibility. In Nigeria, anything is possible. Achike, Jude. Yes, for me, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about uh, the ability of uh, people who have been given political power uh, to be able to use these powers for the uh, good and interest and welfare of the people. Ultimately, it's about the outcome of whatever intervention they want to uh, make. Uh, politicians, uh, before they came to power, you know, um, made promises to the people. And so we can make all the arguments about why these things are happening like this. Obviously, 
uh, when the CBN under the new management did not uh, want, uh, did not envisage a situation where dollar uh, would be exchanging with Naira for about 1,400, you know, uh, uh, 1,400 to, to, I mean, Naira to the dollar. Uh, they have been making all manners of uh, intervention even before now. Uh, and all of these interventions have not worked. So we don't know exactly whether even these uh, uh, interventions are also uh, going to achieve results. But uh, it is very clear that uh, even if we are, to tell you how bad it is, that we are now talking about uh, intervention to just stem uh, the further, further rise of uh, the, or fall of uh, the Naira above 1,400. 1,400 is reprehensible. It is scandalous and abominable, and there has created all manners of a crisis within the economy. Uh, the political, you know, office holders who, you know, promised the Nigerian people that they were there to solve our problems, you know, have a mandate and a duty. How they solve this problem really should not be the problem of Nigerians. Really, um, we, we we had eight years of uh, Muhammad Buhari, and uh, from the beginning, people began to complain about things going wrong, and then they were called all manners of names. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, all manners of names. And then uh, one month became two months, three, it became three months, and then the first, te you know, tenure, you know, went the first time, and then the second time, after eight years, look at where we are. And I tell people, for those who are saying, look, it is still early, this is uh, nine, ten months of uh, the, um, the, the, the government, uh, the APC government of Bolame Tinubu, before you know it, it's another four years, and then we are still talking about uh, giving time. Nigerians have given time, over 60 years of patience by Nigerians after our independence, and there is nothing to show uh, for it. So while we do all of the uh, intellectual you know, uh, gimmickry and uh, sophisticated ar arguments, which is true as an economist, he uh, you know, knows what he's saying. But ultimately, like I said, there is a responsibility and a duty and an obligation for political leaders to make do on the promises that they have made to the Nigerian people. I think that is what we are, we are looking at. There is so much suffering in the country today, unprecedented. People, you know, do not have access to medical, you know, to health care. People, you know, the roads are unsafe and so many other things. It is the duty and responsibility of government uh, to fulfill their promises to the people. It's as simple as that, ultimately, really. Well, but uh, Niger, Tonglash in Nigeria, what do you think? Well, uh, look, what has happened, I mean, it, it was inevitable from the moment that uh, this uh, crisis uh, started. Uh, don't forget that um, a situation of, uh, you know, where the president, we are told that the president wanted to pass Nigerian airspace, and then they, they declined. And so they had to look for reroute, you know, his, his, his uh, air route, and then till he landed in Abuja. Uh, so obviously this is not expected. But then when you look at the fact that uh, there is already, you know, an anim I mean, animus between uh, both countries. And uh, again, it's about the interest, not necessarily the interest of the Nigerian people, but the interest of the junta uh, that, is, um, that feels uh, threatened uh, by Nigeria's action uh, in concert with uh, the ECOWAS. One would also understand why uh, they, are, they are doing this. Uh, obviously, what has happened, even pulling out of uh, ECOWAS, is just uh, what they have been looking for. Because we know even before now, the kind of intervention that uh, ECOWAS under with uh, the uh, support of uh, Jonathan Goodluck, who was a leader of uh, that uh, team that was appointed by the former president, uh, to try to bring about a transition program, putting pressure on the, the various uh, junta from uh, Burkina Faso to Guinea, uh, you know, uh, to Mali and then all, all the games that they are playing. So I think what is going on, the pulling out of, uh, of uh, these countries from uh, uh, ECOWAS, I think um, is, is, is part of the script that they had worked out for themselves. So for, as for Niger, uh, the reality is that um, Nigeria no longer has the kind of clout that Nigeria had years back. We, we also have to admit that. Nigeria is far ahead of these countries when you look at even uh, the econo economy and so many other things. Uh, you know, economic might and strength and the rest. And these are very, very important, you know, uh, to consider when you are looking at uh, international politics. Uh, but then the, the reality is that uh, we have uh, lost a leadership role uh, because uh, this is us in Niger. This is Niger that uh, we have done a lot, you know, for. Uh, but then again, um, uh, like I said, there is, there is uh, an interest to protect uh, by the regime. Uh, so they are going to come increasingly under pressure uh, from their people. 
Uh, but for now, perhaps uh, the honeymoon, the honeymoon is still not over uh, between them and their people. Crunch time definitely will come, and then when we come, when it comes, we see exactly what is going to happen. But it's also a lesson because, in as much as we want to lambast all of these countries, and we should really, of course, a military intervention is an aberration to democracy. But we should also ask ourselves, you know, questions about. Uh, we cannot forget the fact, uh, you know, and it's not as if one is providing excuses for them. Our political leadership in Africa and in the West African subregion have to sit up and stop creating the circumstances for which some military adventurists we want to use as an excuse uh, to take to come to power. Don't provide them with these excuses. And then they will find it very difficult, if not impossible, for them to even dream of taking uh, you know, over from you know, power because they know that they will be resisted from the people who are already, already enjoying the dividends of democracy in those countries. Well, uh, Dr. Biareli, yes. Three countries moving out, but there's also uncertainty in Seneca with President Macky Sall saying that elections have been postponed indefinitely, and yet he has to leave that office constitutionally on April the second. Dr. Bati, um, just like what you just said, um, um, West Africa and Africa has actually, you know, uh, have, we've come to a level where we need to ask ourselves questions. We need to look inward and ask ourselves what is wrong with us. We are not the people that invented modern democracy. From Greece to the US and the other part of the world, democracy has been there for over 200, 300 years. Why is that always in Africa? That you always have this problem of sit tight leaders, people doing things that do not you know, conform with the expectations of their people. Military rule is an aberration in any society because they are despotic. In fact, that is why we are where today in Nigeria. Because you know, I was just agreeing with somebody yesterday. I said, our founding fathers, if you, if you, if for any company to be established, the partners will first of all define their visions and their mission. And based on their visions and their mission, they will run. The founding fathers of Nigeria, Amadou Bello, Obafemi Awolo, Wadi Nam came together in 1960, defined clearly the vision of Nigeria and how they wanted to work together under a constitutional arrangement, fiscal arrangement that suits the heterogeneous nature of Nigeria. And that was how they came about with that constitutional arrangement that allowed the regions to be autonomous and independent and then a loose and weak center. It worked in 1960. 1963, we had the um, Midwestern Nigeria. But in 1966, young boys that we never elected decided to shoot their way to power. From 1966 till now, Nigeria had not had peace. It had been stumbling from one problem to another. Governance in Africa, civilian governments in Africa must not provide the enabling. Look at what's happening in Senegal. Macky Sall is trying to bend the rules, trying to become an emperor in a, 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 a country that has been a bastion of democracy in West Africa. We should, and I we expect ECOWAS. ECOWAS should not only intervene when it involves military intervention. This is a constitutional coup. I expect President Tinibu and the rest of West Africa to rise up emphatically and condemn what Macky Sall is doing and call him to order. It is not just when he has created the environment for the military Senegal to strike. Now we'll start on a helter skelter. Look at what's happening in Niger, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali. These are our nearest neighbors. In fact, Niger had the highest boundary, a kind of landmass with Nigeria. On the north is Niger. The west, uh, yes, east is uh, Benin Republic. On the west is Cameroon. So we should not allow Niger Republic to be antagonistic to Nigeria for our own mutual interest. Some of the things, Niger played a huge role with Chad in curtailing the influx of terrorists into Nigeria. If we, if we get to a situation where Niger now become a mutual enemy of Nigeria, it will not go well way for us. After all, look at Benin Republic. Benin is providing a quasi sea port for Niger Republic, which is what Nigeria will have been doing for them by now. So, like I said, military rule is, an, is unacceptable in a modern democracy. But those who purport to operate under a democratic environment must respect the rule of the game. Yeah. Electoral reform must be very sacrosanct. Like you saw the, 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 the by-elections in Nigeria. Most people did not even remember that was election yeah. because people have lost hope. Yeah. I make my stop big time in 2023. And if we actually want to grow this country. The first thing we must do, we must embark on urgent constitutional, electoral, physical, and judicial reforms. Bulatinibu is on record since 1999 to have been an apostle of physical federalism. Sovereign National Conference. 
the fact, at his age, and God has blessed him, and he's not like a puppet. He's a president that came to power, planned it all his life to be president. He's not beholden to anybody. The only legacy he can leave to Nigeria, for Nigeria and Nigerians is for him to quickly mobilize the National Assembly and it had six state governors to amend the constitutional and physical framework of Nigeria back to what we had in 1963. In fact, I will advise okay, them. Let that. them pick up the 1963 constitution, dust it, Delineate it into six regions and pass it as the new constitution. That's the only way this country will survive. I get your point, Dr. Biarere. This one that Nigeria is insulting us. You are saying Nigeria should take the lead again, you know, to go and intervene in Senegal so that we'll go and collect an, another <laughs> slap in the face from Senegal. Is that what you are recommending? No, to be, to be very honest, we must not shy away from doing the right thing. Nigeria should lead the rest of West Africa to call Makisali to order. He's already laying the ground foundation for the military to over in Senegal. Nobody can blame them when they do it. Okay, fine. Let's take another subject. Let's uh, come back home to Nigeria, where yesterday by-elections were held Saturday across 26 states of Nigeria. And that was in um, 80 local government areas. Uh, over 4.9 million uh, register voters, 4.6 million uh, persons with uh, permanent uh, voters' cards. But the exercise did not pass off without flashpoints at various locations. The Independent National Electoral Commission said that following several cases of irregularities, disruption of election, and abduction of electoral materials and officials, it has to suspend rerun elections in Ikonoini Federal Constituency of Akwaibom and two constituencies in Enugu and Kano states. The commission also called on security agencies to investigate the incident, as well as assured Nigerians of his commitment to initiate a thorough interrogation of any possible breaches by electoral officials. Many months after the general elections of 2023, as a result of resignation, uh, death, and vacancies uh, occasion either by post-election litigation or the appointment of certain persons uh, to positions like a speaker, former speaker of the House of Reps, uh, like uh, Minister Lubumi Ujo, these vacancies occurred. And now both rerun elections and by-elections, we've seen the same pattern. Hoodlums taken over, violence in Akwaibom, in, uh, in Kano, Poor turnout in uh, Kaduna uh, by election. Irregularities are uh, resulting, in fact, in the suspension of the process in Plateau State, where we were told that uh, ballot papers, uh, you know, did not arrive uh, adequately. Have we learned any lessons? Uh, where are we? You would think that, I mean, every other by election or rerun should show that uh, we have moved from a certain point where we were in 2023. Well, it, is said, it is said that when a crime goes unpunished, the heart of the people is filled with uh, rebellion. You know, and um, there's nothing that encourages perfid perfidy than not to punish uh, perpetrators of a crime. Um, I think Nigerians learned a lesson, uh, and the politicians also learned a lesson after the last uh, general election in the country. And that is that power is not uh, a given Power is not uh, something that is generated by the people and for the people. Uh, power is taken. And then when you take power, you consolidate at other levels and legitimize your stay, you, know, you legitimize your power grab. And, and that in itself has uh, turned people off. Look, any redeemable damage was done to the psyche of Nigerians with regards to electoral politics in this country after the last general election, Nigerians completely switched off after that and said, well, if this is the way they want to go, they, want to, they will not be part of it. Perhaps it might not be the right attitude. Perhaps we know because um, you know, there is no easy road to freedom. And there's somewhere along the line, the people must on their own engage at those people that are trying to undermine their country. But it is very clear that uh, what we see as low you know, voter turnout was predicted and they, of course, it's what the politicians want. Because you know, when you give them a field day like this, then they run riot over the system. 
And that is exactly what we are seeing. We have seen, you know, after the general election itself, we had the off-cycle election in three states of uh, Kogi, uh, Imo State, and uh, and the Bayasa State, and we have seen how those elections were run. We have seen the outcome. A complete voter apathy, again, uh, uh, the the activities of uh, thugs and all manners of uh, antisocial, anti, antisocial deviants. We saw the general, uh, you know, matching order by the security agencies that the thugs definitely will laugh at, uh, you, you know, because it, it doesn't work. Uh, that the, the, the people will tell you that uh, the security agencies, when it comes to elections in this country, are compromised. You know, we have seen even on, on the, on, in, you know, in the field, uh, some of them, how they also look away when certain, you know, anti, uh, de, you know, uh, democratic uh, practices, electoral practices are being perpetrated. There's always that tendency for some of them to want to look away uh, because somebody, you know, is beating the drum and then so they have to respond to it. And we have some good security personnel, there's no doubt about that. But again, you're talking about the system. The Nigerian system, you know, is unfortunately right now as it is, has very few refined, you know, refining, you know, qualities. And this is what we see in terms of every election. And just like you also said, same old thing. And that's why, you know, I, I tend to quote a friend of mine who said that the more things seem to change, the more they remain the same. So what has happened with elections in the country? Why do you have up to today, I mean, when you have a state-run election, maybe an off-cycle election, you are still deploying 35,000 uh, policemen, 40,000 policemen, where you should be drawing down on the number of uh, security participation in those elections. Because it will tell you, and that is the greatest, you know, revelation of the fact that uh, there's something inherently wrong with our democracy. If you started with that five thousand soldiers being deployed to a state in an off cycle election in nineteen ninety nine, by two thousand and three, two thousand and four, you should be talking of, of about four thousand, five thousand, you know, and all that. So these are so it tells you our democracy is wrong and the output and the second and, and the outcome of our democracy which is manifested in the social crisis that we're having today the insecurity that we're having today are all embedded are all part of you know the fact that we when it comes to the issue of election of you know political leaders the system itself works against the people conspires against the people in such a way that the wrongest set of people are generated and are produced you know by our electoral system and so what do you now have as the output the crisis of even the the the, the data exchange that we all of these things are related all of these things you know uh, come together and uh, you know in the mix well, Dr. Biari. Uh, Dr. Bati, what, what we see happen in Nigeria is a symptomatic manifestation of the foundational issue. The foundational issue is the foundational issue that has to do with the constitutional and fiscal arrangement that we have in Nigeria. Between 1966 and 1966, salaries and pecks of office of political officers that were started out of the civil service, it was part time. Yeah. We had men like Sir Louis Odimbevo Juku, reputed to be the wealthiest man in Africa. As a parliamentarian, chairman of 15 Corporation, he wasn't going there to carry ballot box because he wanted to show up his sagging economic life. He wanted to go there to add his values, to add his intellectual acumen and his experiences in building a great nation. And we had the best years in that physical arrangement when we had people like Dr. Michael Obama, 39 years old, building 214 kilometer industrial belt in the old eastern Nigeria. Today, what we have is a constitutional issue. You cannot execute electoral reform without looking at the foundational issue. If we, if we go back to 1963 constitution, because most of these guys prey on religion and ethnicity because of the convoluted unitary structure that Abdul Salam Mabaka handed over to us. If we go back to 1966 constitution, the physical arrangement, where the regions and the state will control 50% of whatever they produce from their regions, pay 30 to the national port and 20 to the federal government, and then limit the role of the federal government to issue of security. Of course, regions will have their own security and even the municipals. You will have the best of Nigerians coming out to contest. What we have to most Nigerians who have the competence and capacities are running away from the criminal elitist gangsterism that we call democracy. That is why you see people now gleefully carry ballot box because somebody who has no economic life, has never added value in his private sector life, sees that he can easily get one and 60 million naira SUV, collect allowances that is what, better than even what US president collects. What do you think he would do? He will carry gun, he will, carry, he will bend the rules, he will bribe everybody, bribe everyone. If we don't fix the foundation, 
with the constitutional and physical framework of Nigeria back to what we had in 1966, Dr. Abati. The next election cycle in 2027, they may even come with Mota and Bazooka. Because we have created the foundation for criminals to control the system. And they are not going to give up until we remove the rug from under their feet. And that rug can only be removed when we execute massive constitutional, physical, electoral, and judicial reform. And that is where Tinibu comes in. Tinibu with a lot of influence over those in the National Assembly. He must have a matter of emergency and national urgency. Please impanel the resolution of Nigeria back to what we have in that is what, Let me tell you, even if we bring an angel and import angels to come and govern Nigeria under this arrangement, this country will only continue to go and look at our history. From 1999 now, we've always continually gone from one worst government to another. Yeah. It's a system thing that we must correct it from the foundation. Well, I hope some people are listening. But quickly, let's go to our vision where Aaron Akirijola is waiting. Nigeria's uh, Super Eagles are now set to meet with the Bafana Bafana of South Africa in one of the semi-final games at the 34th African Cup of Nations in Ivory Coast. The other semi-final will be between the host country Ivory Coast and Democratic Republic of Congo. South Africa, last night, defeated Cape Verde on penalties with goalkeeper Ronwen Williams emerging man of the match after saving four out of five kicks from the island boys of Cape Verde. Well, for more on developments uh, with AFCON 2023 and a whole lot more, I'm now being joined from Abidjan by RI's correspondent, Aaron Akiridola, who is also having on standby an ex-international and team coordinator of the Super Eagles, Patrick Pascal. Good evening, Aaron. Thank you for joining this day live, this Sunday talk show. Hi, Aaron. Thank you very much, oh, um, Doctor. Aaron I, uh, and AB. I see that yes. AB is with you there. Be Betty, okay. So, very yes, good. AB is with me here, yes, Doctor. Well, so I, we are. AB, we, yes, greetings. Live, greetings uh, from Lagos. Greetings from Lagos. Okay, very good. Well, Aaron, <laughs> your optimism <laughs> seems to have paid off. Uh, last week, Sunday, you were predicting that the Super Eagles would do well, get to the finals, and win eventually. And yesterday was really. Uh, very exciting with uh, the Super Eagles beating uh, Angola 1-0 uh, with uh, uh, Moses Simon setting up uh, uh, Lukman uh, who put in that uh, uh, long goal. But uh, Ebi, let me start with you. Uh, who will you consider your man of the match? The goalkeeper, Nwabali, who seems to be emerging as uh, Nigeria's undisputed number one or Victor Simhe or uh, Moses Simon? For the game against, um, Doctor, for the game between Nigeria and Angola, I think there are so many fantastic players on the pitch. Um, giving Uwabali or uh, Victor Sime or Ademira Lukman or even Moses Simon, I think they were all deserving of it. But I think the best man actually won is for the voters. For me, I'll still say. Moses Simon deserved it, and you have the likes of William Trust Ekong, the defender who was very good on the day. Okay, Aaron. Well, we're going to face uh, South Africa yeah, in the semi all. we're facing South Africa in the semi-finals, and then you have Ivory Coast that uh, qualified for the quarterfinals through the back door, and then yesterday again somehow by sheer stroke of luck they've managed to get to the uh, semi-finals. Which teams should we watch out for, South Africa or Ivory Coast <laughs> that may get to the finals uh, through sheer luck again? What do you think, Aaron? All right, so, um, Doctor, um, at the moment, of course, we know that South Africa are in the running, more importantly, um, Congo DR, and also, um, uh, we've mentioned South Africa already, Congo DR, and also not forgetting the hosts themselves, who have, some are calling them not Côte d'Ivoire anymore, they're calling them Lucky d'Ivoire, or Lucky Coast, because the truth is this, they've ridden their luck 
heavily on this tournament. They haven't really shone like a million stars. They haven't really played as host. And at the moment, they will be hoping that that luck that has seen them defeat the defending champions or the former champions right now, talking about the Taranga Lions of Senegal and going against an opponent who they thought probably should be easy on paper. But yesterday, you'll be asking yourself the question, what happened to Mali? But that's football for you. And at the moment, the Super Eagles know that all they need to do is focus on their game, which is the game against the Bafana Bafana of South Africa. Because for you to win this trophy, you must beat what is in front of you. And they've done that time and time again in this particular tournament. They're the most convincing in what has been a spectacular tournament. They are the most solid in what has been a very, very wide and open tournament. The Super Eagles have shown the light. They've led by example. And at the moment, they're in poor position to actually win this particular trophy. Starting with the game on Wednesday against the Bafana Bafana of South Africa. Hopefully, we will find a way since they have uh, shown the light. But I understand you have uh, Patrick Pascal there with you. Uh, guys, uh, if you could just bring him on the screen. Uh, or any of the players in the background there. Hello, can you hear me? AB? Aaron, can you hear me from the studio here in Lagos? Yeah, I can, yes, we can, I, yeah, hear, I can hear We can hear you right now. Okay, is there someone else you can talk to right there on the field? Uh, maybe any of the uh, Nigerian players or Patrick Pascal that I mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah, so, uh, Doctor. Yes. So, Doctor, so, so, Doctor, what we'll do is this. Let's bring in ex-international Patrick Pascal, who also doubles as the team coordinator of this particular national team, so that you can have a talk with him. Because, as you can see behind me, the players are actually running through the paces, preparing for that particular game. This is one of many trainings that would happen before the game against South Africa in Boake. So we have Patrick Pascal here with us, if he can actually join us. And we'll just let you run through things with him quickly. What, um, Patrick Pascal, of course, um, you are on to uh, Arise News. You can actually have the microphone, I must say. You can actually yeah. have the microphone okay, and at the you. moment and let's, uh, so that you can actually listen to you. So, Doctor, it's over to you. You have MON live on Arise News. Okay, Patrick Pascal, well, MON. Doctor, doctor, what else, sir? Thank you for joining us on This Day <laughs> Live else, at the Sunday Talk Show. Well, your impression so uh, far. It's a pleasure. Your impressions so far about the tournament and particularly about the performance of the Super Eagles and individual players from goalkeeper to the midfield to the strikers. Uh, well, uh, Doctor, you know, like we that we are working with the team, we have confidence uh, on the team and then the players. And then even before we come to this competition, week in, week out, you, you follow the players, you see what they are playing from their clubs. And normal, the only thing uh, that we are praying then before coming here, let the performance that they are giving in their clubs, let them give to their country. And then the team turns very well for us and then everything now is going well. Okay, but generally, what's your assessment of the tournament uh, in terms of uh, organization, logistics, and uh, some of the outcomes that we have seen with uh, countries that were originally uh, favorites uh, being uh, uh, sent out of the uh, tournament at one stage or the other? Yeah, well, the organization here is very, is very good because of uh, like the accommodation that we have here, uh, the accommodation is good and the food here too is almost similar to our food. The only thing is as if we don't have pandediam and gari, but you know they have, <laughs> they have plantain and other things here. So and then the security here, they are doing a lot of work here seriously. So the competition here, I can rate it, is one of the best Afghan, you know, among the other ones that pass. Well, ahead of us, we have uh, South Africa. What should we expect? And beyond South Africa, if we win, the possibility of either uh, lucky Ivory Coast or Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. What are your projections, yeah, you know, predictions? The South Africa is 
yeah, the match against South Africa is just like a derby for us. We've been playing with them, and then we don't underrate even any country. You know, in African football now, you cannot underrate any country. So we are going full, all out, all out. We are going to make sure we qualify to the finals. Well, what is the morale among uh, the Super Eagles? We've seen them, uh, you know, performing excellently well, with even in one ballet keeping uh, a clean sheet, you know, uh, four, four, uh, you know, clean sheet record, meeting only a record that was set 44 years ago, in 1980, by uh, Rufai, Peter Rufai. Uh, well, uh, uh uh, Mwabele is a good goalkeeper because of if you follow uh, the clubs he played even in Nigeria, uh, he played uh, Eimba, Lobby, Wiki Torres, and then he has been doing very well. And Chipa United in South Africa, he has one of the best goalkeeper even in South Africa. Then the only thing normal, uh, what player need is uh, to give him a chance to come and prove himself. And then we are very happy that we have him now and then things are going very well in the national team. Okay, I mixed that up. It was best to Gedegbe that I, I was uh, to refer to in 1980, not Peter Rufai, best to Gedegbe. But, you know, uh, what level of encouragement, apart from the president speaking and addressing the boys, what level of encouragement uh, do you particularly appreciate is it from the fans club there in uh, Ivory Coast or from the Nigerian government? Uh, what has been the level of support generally? Not just from government, but generally. Even from the Nigerian community in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And I tell you, the time that we arrive here, the, the Nigerian community here, they receive us very well. And then the support we are getting here from people, uh, you know, coming to our hotels, even the Senate President was here, almost five governors was here, and then the Minister of uh, uh, Sport was here too, and then uh, all the NFL people, Ibrahim Gusau was here daily with us, Okocha and uh, Shegun Odegbami, in and out, they are coming to give their support, and then they are, they are gingering the boys that they can do it. And then you know our slogan, let's do it again. So that slogan, is with us and then we are moving on with that slogan well indeed let's do it again uh, nigerians would like to see you know the super eagles <laughs> win the uh, trophy uh, for a record four time thank you very much uh, patrick pascal for joining us on this live this sunday talk show thank you very much indeed aaron my pleasure yes doctor i'm still with you here yes and aaron. Of course, i'm still with ab here we're still trying to soak in all that is happening here with the Super Eagles because you can actually see um, the training is actually intensifying. Doctor, these boys are ready for battle. These boys mean business. And one thing is certain, when I've not seen this level of confidence, I've not seen this level of seriousness in the Super Eagles like this in a very long time. The last time we saw them, hunger for this was back in 2013 when we lifted that particular gong in South Africa. And this time around, we are playing South Africa. Would you call that fates? I don't know. But Dr. Wendy says it's certain. Well, the Super Eagles are ready. Yeah. You can actually see them screaming, running for the ball. Well, as Pascal said, let's do it again. Abby, do you agree that we can do it again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, Doctor, as the tournament keeps moving on, I think the confidence of Nigerians, fans, the teams, even the media here keeps growing because we, it seems they keep growing it by every game, chemistry-wise, everything, the confidence is there. I think that Nigeria has a fate with destiny, a day to destiny that's come February 7th where they face South Africa. They did it in 2013. In 2019, they defeated um, South Africa at the quarterfinal stage in Egypt. So I think Nigeria can still do it again. They have all it takes, all the support at the moment. Well, we'll do it again. That's what Nigerians want to hear. Thank you very much, Aaron Akirajala, and thank you very much, uh, Ebi Yomo, uh, reporting from uh, Ivory Coast. Well, gentlemen, very quickly, you've been listening. 
can we do it again? <laughs> Achike. Yes, yes, we have we have what it takes. We have what it takes. But there's a lesson also to learn from what has happened to the heavyweights. And that is the fact that um, uh, um, we, we, we have seen that uh, there are no underdogs. And so what it, that, that should, you know, um, what you should tell us is that we must not underestimate South Africa. Yes, we have always had the edge over South Africa, virtually every time, maybe 90% of the time we, times we have played them, we have always uh, been able to uh, beat them. And uh, so I don't think this is going to be different, but caution is the watchword. We should just be careful. Don't underrate them. Don't take them uh, for granted. Give them the necessary respect and then show the resilience. I mean, I like the chemistry in the team. I like the balance in the team from, you know, the goalkeeper. For the first time, we're having a steady hand. Uh, I mean, uh, in the days, just like you mentioned, two of, of those best of getting with Peter Rofai, Okala, and the rest, and then, of course, Vicente Yama and a few other goalkeepers. After that, the last set of goalkeepers we have had have not been exactly yeah. very consistent. So that yeah. has given confidence maybe, to maybe the Maybe we've been able yeah, now so. to solve our goalkeeping problem. Yeah, problems, yeah. Briefly, as yeah. we begin to wrap Dr. up. Bassi, first Dr. Bassi, first of all, I, these, these guys have made us to eat our words. You know, there was a time, last time I was in your studio, I referred to Pesero as low budget Jose, Jose Mourinho. <laughs> and it actually has proven to be Jose Mourinho's protege because you watch their game, very solid at the back, yeah, very, very compact very in the very midfield, very you know. Yeah, Wish yeah. them all the best of luck. Yeah. And uh, our boys have actually shown the spirit of Nigeria, the true spirit of Nigeria. Resilience, determination, excellence, teamwork and patriotism. This is one team that have showed clearly that together, everybody bringing his own A game. Nigeria can do great things. This is a, a country that is so blessed by God. And I pray that this will be a mark of the revival that we expect from this country. In every other sphere of life, the politicians will learn from these guys. Oneness, together, in love, delivering the On goal for the good of Nigeria and the nation. On that note, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Namika Obiariri and also Achike Chude. It's been a pleasure. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. Here on Arise News, I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching.